Now, I was calling your attention to this area around Salt Lake City and how they're expected to have a large population growth headed into the 2020s. Now we want to take a look at what Utah Department of Natural Resources is doing to combat this expected population growth and mitigate the effects of it on both wildlife and natural spaces. Utah is a state of incredible beauty. People are moving here to enjoy it in record numbers. Right now, Utah has about three million people. We're projected in the next 30 years of reaching six million people. The influx is creating a big problem. We have new housing developments going up. A lot of the valleys have already been developed, so they're pushing into the foothills where our big game species spend the winter. To solve the confrontation between humans and nature, Utah's Department of Natural Resources has turned to technology. The edge of Utah's Great Salt Lake is a conflict zone. The lake is home to nearly 20,000 white pelicans. But next to the lake is bustling Salt Lake City International Airport. Planes have crossed paths with airborne pelicans with deadly results. So the airport asked Utah DNR for ideas to avoid these dangerous collisions. And they devised a plan to map pelican flight patterns. It starts with capturing a bird. First, DNR scientists bury harmless leg holds on this small island, a favorite pelican rest stop. Then they retreat and wait. Hey, it looks like we got one. Once you get control of it, the pelican actually becomes pretty docile. That gives us a chance to attach the transmitter, attach the bands, um, take our measurements that we need to take. Team leader Adam Brewerton first checks out the bird's overall health, while a colleague enters data into Esri's collector app to instantly create a digital record for the bird. Then the bird is fitted with a GPS transmitter. And as soon as we release it, that individual bird's locations can start showing up on our database. So far, over 100 birds have been fitted with transmitters. Individual points? Back at headquarters, so. the Pelican data is collated and analyzed by the GIS team. And a 3D map is created using ArcGIS Pro. Then, it becomes strikingly clear. Birds are flying in some of the busiest flight paths. They've even been tracked at nearly 30,000 foot altitudes. Now that the airport has empirical data, it can be used to adjust takeoff and landing routes at key times, reducing the risk of dangerous pelican strikes. With our real-time monitoring, you might be able to tell them on the hour when to watch out. There's a thousand pelicans coming past the airport. Be on the alert. To get the public involved, DNR has developed a custom web app using ArcGIS called Pelatrack. Now, anyone in the world can follow the pelicans in their travels and even help track their migration. The birds have developed a huge fan base. Well, I think the pelican story was a bit of the tip of the iceberg for us. We discovered the value of receiving real-time information. But more important than that is we begin to see the value of new capabilities at DNR. Another area of potential deadly contact between humans and animals is on Utah's busy roads and highways, which frequently cross deer and moose migration routes. It's not well understood that we may kill as many mule deer with cars as we do with guns. To solve the problem, a mule deer is restrained with a harmless net, then fitted with a tracking collar. Thousands of animals have been fitted in this way. Using the collected data, ArcGIS maps reveal the animal's seasonal movements, pinpointing spots where they're most likely to attempt to cross a highway. This data is shared with the State Department of Transportation. They'll put fencing in to keep the animals off of the road and then put crossing structures to move the animals across the highways. Crossing structures like this soon to open wildlife overpass, as well as over 50 tunnels. 
they adapt to the locations of these wildlife crossings over time so they can still make the movements they need to. And that combination of mitigation measures typically reduces wildlife vehicle collisions about 90 percent. DNR also relies on ArcGIS to restore damaged natural habitat. Another concern as we grow in population is having adequate water. I literally had a sleepless night worrying how are we going to plan for and take care of the growth. We've been in a continual drought. We're getting continual fire, so we started our watershed restoration initiative. The initiative is restoring degraded land to a more natural condition. Thirsty, unwanted plants and trees are removed and replaced with native grasses that restore the soil and keep it hydrated. We use maps to decide where we're going to do the treatment, then we do the treatment, and then we use the maps to follow up to make sure the treatment was successful and the results have been amazing. We've created lands that are resilient to fire, over two million acres of improved landscapes. Esri's ArcGIS platform has become an essential tool for Utah DNR. There are real challenges that we're facing, but it's very easy to reach the right conclusions when your map tells a very clear and concise story. We can't do our job without the insight that GIS delivers. Our impact is greater now. Our GIS is a game changer for us. And it's helping humans and nature live together safely in the state of Utah. I love that video. It's just such a great example of the transformational power of GIS across many workflows. You saw people out in the field collecting information. You saw decision makers having that information at their, at their, where they needed in their office. We saw public engagement all through ArcGIS. I also want to mention that because Utah DNR has been a progressive thought leader in this field, they've also provided a lot of feedback to Esri to help us build some of our solution templates, which is what we're going to talk about next. Now, quick show of hands, how many of you have deployed one or more solution templates? Okay, good to see. So solution templates, we actually have over 450 options. They are free, open source, and configurable tools available for multiple industries, multiple workflows to help you get from start to finish much more quickly. We would like to dive into one of these solution templates so you get a better idea of what this looks like and how it could be deployed. Today we're gonna be highlighting conservation easement monitoring now, I know maybe not all of you need conservation easement monitoring, but I bet you can utilize the base workflows that are included in this whole option. Field workers, office staff who need access to information and public engagement, right? Everybody needs those type of workflows. In this case, we're focusing on a specific overall workflow, utilizing and supporting those people. Let's take a look at what this actually means. So programs that might monitor easements, conservation easements to be exact, could be state agencies like a Department of Natural Resources. These are private lands used for public purposes, so it's important to keep an inventory of those lands, polygons, their boundaries, and all of the information about them, as well as what is changing over time. So I'm here in a web map that was deployed when I deployed the solution for conservation easement monitoring. And this web map contains, um, we have boundaries of all the different lands in Maryland that are being monitored. So if I go to my bookmarks and focus in on a specific easement, I can see this green polygon representing its boundaries, and perhaps a GIS analyst at, say, the state DNR would be responsible for keeping this up to date. There's a second layer of data in here, and that is these pop-ups. So I'm seeing all the information about this easement, its owner, when it was acquired when it joined the program to be monitored and a brief description. There's another layer of data behind that. 
And those are observation points. So perhaps the DNR has a field staff that needs to go out on, I don't know, four wheelers, I hope, and look through these thousand acre properties to see where human caused alterations have been made to the land. Because the goal here is to keep the land as much in its natural state as possible. Now we see a photo that was taken from someone out in the field and we get information about what they observed. So I think it would be nice there if you could show us how this might look as the actual field worker. You bet. Well, let me tell you, Nicole is always giving me work to do, and today is no exception. So while she was planning projects back at the office using ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Pro, I'm using the Workforce app on my device. As you can see, I'm looking at one of our many conservation easements. It covers a few thousand acres. It's pretty large. And my job is to go out in the field and collect one or more observation points. As I interact with that conservation easement in my device, I can bring up that pop-up, the same one that Nicole just showed, in her view. And you'll notice there's a hyperlink there for starting an inspection. So while I'm out in the field, it's really easy for me to understand where I am, get to where I need to go, and then open up Survey123 so I can collect my observation. Now imagine, if you will, that this used to be a paper-based and manual process. And if I had more than one observation to make across a property that covers a couple thousand acres, you can imagine how long and how intense that workflow can be. But because we're leveraging digital technology, it's a lot easier. Now behind the scenes, when I selected my conservation easement, it pre-populated my survey here with all of this information. So as I tap through, these different sections of the survey, pay attention to the detail of information that's listed here. I still have the option to add in information as needed, but it's definitely a time saver if it can be pre-populated. So there's quite a bit of information here, but because I'm here to make an observation, I'm going to do that now and put in a few details, including a photo. So please smile for the camera. What I'd like to highlight is after I've captured this photo, if you look at the lower right-hand corner, it's provided the date and timestamp and the name of this conservation easement. So maybe not the most exciting thing to you right now, but why this is important, if you scale out this workflow to say even a dozen people making observations in the field and multiple observations, that's less work that has to be done later back at the office because it's done automatically. So as I continue through my workflow, the last thing I'm going to do is sign off on my work and then submit it back to Nicole. So Sarah just showed us how to use Explorer in the field as well as how to leverage Survey123. But say I'm a project manager of a conservation program and I need to keep a high level awareness of all of the inspections that are going on because ultimately at the end of the year, I need to report back to a federal agency, say the US Forest Service. I have this dashboard open and I can see all of the easements that my organization is responsible for, those that require follow-up, including their details, and how many inspections have been completed thus far. I can also filter them based on the, only the parameters that I'm interested in. Now this dashboard is really handy and gives a supervisor a high level understanding of what their field staff is accomplishing. But what about when that supervisor has to do that annual reporting? Also included with the solution template is this document, which is uh, derived from the Survey123 inspections. So this feature template report was included in the solution, and of course you can customize it if you need to, but it will include all of the observation locations, their attributes, a map of them, and also the photos that were taken by the field staff. So this is a huge time saver for anyone in a management position who needs to leverage all of that data entered into Survey123. Feature template reports are a great way to do that, and especially this one that was just included right with the solution. So, like Sarah said, I know that we're not all monitoring large acreage of land in our daily workflows. So what you can do today is go to solutions.arcgis.com 
and find the solutions that pertain to the area that you work in. So we were just looking at one in state governments and natural resources, and I encourage you to go look through and find out what solutions and what repeatable workflows we have already created for you. It's a great shortcut. And I have to add that it's not just for workflows that ha have people in the office and the field. There are also solutions for those folks that remain desktop based. There are solutions that are public facing, such as this one. The way you get started with any solution template is the ArcGIS Solutions Deployment Tool. And this is a free add-in into ArcGIS Pro. It's really handy because once you've installed the add-in, you can see a catalog of all the solutions that are available for you to deploy, and then some nice tasks will guide you step by step through importing your data into this particular template. And it creates all of the maps that feed the apps and any other dashboards or templates that have come with that solution. So it's a great way to get started. OK, so let's just recap. So all of the template solutions that she just walked through and that you saw, the feature template report, the Explorer app, the Survey123 form, all of that was included with a, a solution template, and you deployed it with just one click in ArcGIS Pro. Absolutely. That's a game changer. I suggest you all get to solutions.arcgis.com at the break and check this out. Now, this is not the only solution that's available through the deployment tool. Many of our other solutions are as well. And I need to mention that these solutions are available in both ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise.